you. Joey Fillingham joins us. Uh, Joey is Senator of Mississippi District uh, 41, Chairman Judd B., and Vice Chair of Medicaid. Joey Fillingham, I thank you for joining us, sir. How are you? Good morning to you. Paul, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, look, um, I know it was a it was a very, very successful uh, and contentious in many ways, but the end results were, were very, very good on a multitude of different things. But just from your perspective, um, what do you think were some of the, the, the key points to this? And just kind of analyze and recap uh, from your thoughts the 2022 session. Well, thank you again for having me, Paul. I'll say that there are lots of things, as you so well covered throughout the whole session, mm -hmm. that were – and significant at the te teacher pay raise obviously was a significant um, achievement. You had yeah. um, obviously the tax cut, which was you know debated really from before a session even started all the way to the very end. And in redistricting, people didn't talk about that a whole lot because it was sort of bumped to the very end of session. But I mean, that happens once every 10 years and it's significant in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean we've been we've been around long enough to know some very contentious uh, uh, times when uh, redistricting uh, wasn't as easy as it was uh, this time. But there were minor right. minor disagreements for the most part. I, I think the big news here, certainly from your position as uh, chairman of Judd B, is the news that the Justice Department was not happy with our correction system and hasn't been. I mean this has been a long time coming. But what are we going to mm -hmm. do about this? And uh, from your perspective. What can we do? Well, you know, we have really, um, over the past, I would say, three to four years, tackled you know what we call loosely um, mm -hmm. criminal justice reform. There have been significant, I mean, significant um, pieces of legislation passed. But, of course, it's no shock that the Justice Department, especially now under the Biden administration, is really not happy with our prison system. And some of that rightfully so. I mean, we have an antiquated system. Yeah. Uh, we had had lots of problems with our former commissioner, of course, and um, that didn't help matters any. I do like our new commissioner. I think Mr. Kane is trying his dead level best to make the system work and work much, much better. But lots of money is going to have to be spent, and I think you saw that in the appropriations this session. Yeah. Um, corrections was one of those entities that got a lot of extra money, and without that, we're going to be in federal court for eons. So I think no one likes it. We don't want to spend money on those types of things. We'd rather spend them on, you know, criminal justice and, you know, education and roads and bridges. But this is a core function of state government. And if we don't have a corrections department that works properly, we're just going to find ourselves in endless court battles. Well, that said, the court knew that we were – did they have that information that we were putting that uh, amount of revenue in there? But that, that didn't change their mind. Mm -hmm. And, again, I, I do agree with you. In a state that's uh, that's a Republican state with Republican leadership, the Biden administration was not going to be as fair as they possibly could. That said, yeah. you are right. There are, there are a lot of pathetic things that have been ingrained in that one. And it's almost like um, asking the commissioner to put out a, a fire of a, a, a high-rise building, you know, with a water hose. It's, yeah. just, it's just very difficult for anybody to do. But my question is, gun, somewhere maybe. in the yeah. – yes – the question is, and I think a lot of people are asking this, and I know the commissioner has broached this on the air with me, are we facing a reality where that place just needs to be shut down? I say, I'm talking about that place. The worst of the worst is Parchman. Yeah. Parchman is uh, really a tough nut to crack because, of course, the population has decreased, as we saw in redistricting. We had 65,000 Mississippians yeah. who left the Delta. And so when you're looking for a, a large number of employees to come into a very bad situation, I mean, these are not ideal working conditions by any stretch. Yeah. And you already have a shortage of those employees anxious to go to work. And then you have 65,000 people leave. Um, I think you're going to have to restructure corrections. And I think that's, you're going to start seeing sort of an exodus out of the correction department, maybe from Parchman to the SMCI or to Pearl or to some of these regional uh, facilities. And it's, it's not because we don't like the Delta or we don't want to have, you know, a prison in the Delta. It's nothing regional that we're against that situation. Lord knows we put millions of dollars into that facility and we would be losing a lot of money by abandoning yeah. it. But 
you have to have people who are willing to come in there and work. And if you don't have the workers, it doesn't matter what else you do. I mean, you can offer all the salaries you want to, but if there aren't people living mm-hmm. there who want those jobs and will show up for work day in and day out, it becomes a very unsafe environment for everyone else who is there, prisoners and guards included. Well, it's a catch-22 thing because you hear people saying, certainly Democrats saying, well, the Republicans haven't put enough revenue or, or things in to try to uh, um, recruit business for the Mississippi Delta. That, that is, that's sure. certainly not true because all of these uh, mayors and the supervisors have done everything they possibly You can't force people to build a car plant there or anything else. Um, no. And I have no, 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 no. idea and what I, we're I talking say, about. Let me, well, let me say, uh, finish this one. I have no idea how much sure. we're talking about to build a new prison. But we have had, Lord. I don't think we've had a study committee or we haven't had any committees in the House nor the Senate to address the fact somewhere down the line, instead of putting additional revenue into parchment, is it time to start planning for the future? Well, it is, it's past time to start planning for the future. I was simply going to add, um, it's, it, you're correct. It's not true at all that we haven't made Herculean efforts to try and get businesses mm-hmm. to the Delta. And my friend Lydia Chassanel, my, my Senate deskmate, has uh, confounded the experts, and they have um, several. Milwaukee Tool that's expanding up in her district. Yep. You've got Viking that's now employing over 700 people up in the Delta. So people will work in the Delta, but it's a matter of changing the attitude that the Delta maybe isn't the most ideal location to to raise a family and to have a job and to retire. I mean, people are flooding into Oxford, into South Mississippi, into Soto County, places like that. But we've got to make it uh, cool again and acceptable again for people to locate in the Delta. And I think Senator Chastanel has done a fantastic job of that and other legislators up there. But you're right. The facts on the ground are where they are. And in Sunflower County, there are a very finite number of, uh, you know, adult age men and women who we can hire to work at Parchman. Because, again, if you or I were looking for a job right out of college right now, my guess is Parchman would not be the place that we were yeah. looking to go yeah. hang our, <laughs> our shingle out there as our first job. And, and Joey, you're absolutely right. And, and here's the irony of it. The, the better job we do on education, the least or lesser chance of they're going to stay there in the Mississippi Delta. And if you have a chance to go to work at Viking or Parchment as a security guard, come on. Yeah. You're not going to go to Parchment. What are you going to do? Heck yeah. no. Even, even, to, go to, even to the point of the, if the pay go. were the same. So, yeah. Or Milwaukee, too. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, just working Absolutely. conditions. I mean, <clears throat> who wants to deal day in and day out with, you know, riots and potential riots and people that hate being where they are? I mean, it's just not the ideal working conditions. So God bless the people up there who yeah. are manning, uh, you know, the defenses up there at Parchman. But I would not want to be one of them personally. Well, then you have a situation of can you spend the money by enlarging the existing um, facilities in other parts of the state that have a better um, a revenue or, or, or not revenue, a better um, a, a amount of population where you could draw some a labor from or just building a sure. new prison where there is a population base. Well, you could do and, that. And that's and costly. Again, it's yeah. going to be extremely expensive. I mean, extremely expensive. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we are trying to look at alternative sentencing um, options like house arrest or, you know, these rehabilitation programs for those who maybe are in jail or in prison for drug offenses only. Um, but mm-hmm. again, there's a certain element of the population of violent offenders that you have to have a place, a maximum security place right. for. And that's not going away so, anytime soon. Mm-hmm. I think we've seen the rise in violence across the country right now. Absolutely. So I, I want to ask you when we come back. Since we have this edict from and this ruling from the Justice Department, what are the consequences? And and I would guess the consequences is one way or the other, we, the taxpayers, are probably going to be fined money uh, that somebody's going to get um, as a punishment. And that punishment doesn't come out of the wallets of uh, the governor or the lieutenant governor or anybody else, but it does as a citizen for them and everybody else. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. What are the the punishments if we do not adhere to or move too slowly from what the Justice Department under the Biden administration has demanded? Back with more next. Great. All right, let me get back with uh, Joey. (laughs) I think Perez inserted that one. Joey Fillingame, Senator of Mississippi District 41, Chairman Judd B. and Vice Chairman of Medicaid. The, uh, Joey, the, the cinematographer, more... but that's just between me and him. 
You all, you want to <laughs> expand on that one, or <clears throat> as we were coming back, yeah, I'm getting ready to push the button so that I can yeah. move you across so that both yeah. of you are on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Joy yeah. became a cinematographer. He was changing the angle and checking the light, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I like, mean, Joey, it's stop, early. stop moving the camera. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I will say is Joey knows where the volume is, and that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had people who came on and can't uh, can't figure out where the volume is. So uh, leave Joey alone. He's doing a good job on that one. Any okay, final I'll thoughts on the? Well, any final thoughts on the uh, on the issue of the the corrections department? Well, yeah, Paul, you you hit the nail on the head as as you typically do. Um, what we're going to face if we don't end up, you know, funding on a higher level uh, the corrections department is the same thing we have with mm -hmm. CPS right now. We'll have a federal judge that we have to report into every six months or so, and they get to tell us that we're not spending enough, and they can court order more spending, you know, millions more. We're not talking about even hundreds of thousands. We're talking about millions of dollars. And those are dollars that can't go into classrooms, into roads and bridges, into law enforcement. So we've got to do our part as best we can to try to avoid the federal mandates from the federal judges um, on this issue like we face in CPS. Never understood that because that means they are overriding the uh, appropriation process in the state of Mississippi or any other state, how they have that power to do that. But, um, the, and I guess at some point, if that's not done, then somebody's probably going to go to jail, but it's never reached that, uh, mm -hmm. that point. All right. Well, the, exactly. the, well, uh, well, our former commissioner is, is in jail now, so people have gone to jail. Well, that, that, that was a little bit different, but then again, his, his appropriation department don't, don't, uh, was don't, working. Don't, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't, <laughs> don't throw him under okay. the bus. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I think about exactly some of the other things going on, and, and uh, one of the stories out there from the liberal uh, press out there was uh, the judge did this, the Justice Department, and then they, they revealed all of the things that really do need to be fixed. It's a, it's a hellish way to live life there. I would much rather for them, to, like the South Carolina, I have that story, put me up before a firing squad to, to, to know that I've got to live the rest of my days uh, in, that, in that situation there. But uh, they, they conflated the fact what and, and let me paraphrase these, these heartless SOB Republicans had the audacity to cut taxes at the same time and, and, and oh, make man. vulnerable revenue in the state of Mississippi. So in other words, a serial killer uh, should have the money, but the people who pay taxes should not in a, in a period of surplus. And it's just, it's just it's never ending from these people. It's insanity. I mean, I think we often forget what um, should really be our maxim as conservatives, that we can't spend any money that we don't first take from the taxpayers. So it's not our mm -hmm. money. We get up there sometimes, especially those of us who are fortunate enough to have been reelected multiple times as I have, and you have the temptation or the tendency to think, well, this is our budget. It's our money. We can spend it however we want to. We have to constantly remind ourselves, and, and your show is perfect at doing that, um, and we appreciate that service, or we should, I do, yeah. um, that it's not our money. It's, of course, I pay my taxes too individually and in my business, but yeah. when I go to Jackson, I get under the dome, it's not my money to decide how to spend. It's the taxpayer's dollars. And if we keep that front of mind, it becomes much easier to vote for tax uh, refunds or for tax cuts because that's less money we have to take out of a household budget yeah. in Sumrall or Hattiesburg or Collins. So it's, it's important, to, and you're so good at that, Paul, and, and not just blowing smoke well, here, I, but I, I without you. the free press, we can easily lose focus sometimes um, to think that this is our money and we can spend it however we want. I was looking over the bills here, and I always like to do that uh, post-legislative um, um, session when we have uh, some members of the House and Senate on, and it's, it shows you all the bills that you've put forth, most of them, of course, like everybody else dies in committee. It's very difficult to get a bill passed all the way. You did have sure. SB 2246 approved by the governor, electronic search warrant, uh, authorized issuance yes. of an investigation for certain sex offenses. You want to speak to that? And this would be against children. So speak to that, Joy. Yes, sir. Absolutely. This was a bill I can't take credit for. I did file it, but the Attorney General, <clears throat> General Fitch, and her a shop mm -hmm. over across the street said, look, we have a finite number, about five or six 
um, in criminal investigators who specifically go all over the state anytime there's a computer crime against a child that is reported in. And under the old law, um, these people would have to spend literally hours of their day um, every week driving to Greenwood or driving down to Biloxi. Most of these people are, are stationed in Jackson at the headquarters there. And they were spending all these hours on the road simply tracking down a judge to get a search warrant approved. And in modern days, when uh, we have the ability to email, to pick up a cell phone and call, to, to fax, uh, you know, to do all these things, most other states have gone to the electronic version of a search warrant and approval for said warrant. So you can get on a Zoom call like this with a judge, and it's just like being in her courtroom face to face, but it saves you sometimes five, six hour round trips getting down and back. And that's time better spent actually investigating the alleged crime and saving these vulnerable children. So we were able to pass that. We actually, um, you took on this a little bit ago, talking about firing squads, we actually revisited the death penalty in Mississippi because it's really getting difficult in some circumstances, the attorney general tells us, to secure the cocktail of drugs that we use for lethal injection. So we revisited that law as well. We're able to get that passed to basically say, if you can find a generic drug that does the same thing that one of these other name brand drugs yeah. do. Sometimes they're easy to get a hold of, just like any other type of pharmaceutical pursuit. So we broaden the ability of the Attorney General and the Department of Corrections, really, to secure the types of drugs that we would need to carry out a lethal injection. Well, I got this story coming up, because, uh, and it's also how this is done, and uh, it's very, very interesting what happens afterwards, who will be there to watch and witness uh, and uh, it looks like they may be going ahead with this in South Carolina, which is a firing squad, which is um, mm-hmm. is kind of unique. Uh, but the reason they're doing that is because they also do not have the lethal injection uh, material anymore. They can't get it. So that, that yeah, a lot it of was these either, pharmaceutical and, companies and are I getting think he had a choice. Woke, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I think Utah uses a firing squad. We actually have in our statute the ability to use firing squad. We have set a preference for a lethal injection because we believe it's you know the most humane version but if in fact we get to a place where we're never able to get the drugs for the lethal injection we have uh, about four different options including the firing squad yeah. for carrying out death penalty what would the four options be i mean we would bring back the electric chair or the gas chamber yes it's um the gas chamber electric chair firing squad um, but the preference of course is always to use lethal injection drugs so long as you can yeah. get them a lot of these companies have gotten woke now, and they don't want the bad press, you know, that the libs no. put out saying, oh, you well, know, it, Bayer it, it, or it, Pfizer or whoever it, used our it, drugs to put someone to death. Ultimately, they make things worse. On I don't care if it's flushing toilets or execution, the same thing uh, for liberals. Uh, because I, I've witnessed uh, a, a execution as far as lethal, and I had one of my cohorts uh, years ago who witnessed uh, a gas uh, chamber, Mm. and he was still haunted all of his life from the gas chamber, the lethal. Believe me, if anybody had a a choice, that would be it. This guy in South Carolina apparently does. He had a a, a choice, but a gas, gas, uh, rather the uh, lethal was not one of those choices. So, all right, any of your final thoughts here, sir? That's amazing. Yeah. um, Final final thoughts. um, the final thought on that topic, no one likes that business at all uh, or takes any joy in it, mm-hmm. but um, the gravity of that and the, you know, the scariness factor of how we put people to death is only, um, in comparison, not nearly as bad as the rapes and the maimings and the murders of this person who's being put to death that committed without any yes. sense of the victim's um, feelings or pain level. So um, we don't like it, but uh, these people, once they get to this point, they more than deserve mm-hmm. Will we have an, a special session, do you think? What's your odds on that one for the initiative process? I doubtful. I don't think so. I haven't heard about that. Um, I think mm-hmm. probably the only special session we may would have is if there's a major economic development project. They can't wait till January. But I, I've been wrong before many times, so I st- stand to be corrected on that. But I have not heard of anything like that. Well, I wish we'd hear about an economic development thing. That would be good. Um, and uh, Nobody that minds yeah. having a special session for that. Yeah. Joey's always yes, good. Sir. Good to th- thank you, sir. On, on a Monday, oh, I appreciate you joining us very, very much. And thank uh, you, for you, me. It's you a do. A great, I think you, I think you do a very good job with the video and everything else. I don't care what Perez says. Volume is well, perfect. I don't have the subject Background's matter to work okay. with like you do, but I mean, we do the best we can. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. 
Thank you so very much. Joey filling Gaines, you, Senator from Mississippi District 41, Chairman Judd B., Vice Chairman, Medicaid Committee.